Okay, it is 12 on the dot almost, so we'll uh, go ahead and, and get started. Uh, first off, hello everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today um, for our webinar that's entitled AXLPA Standards and Guidelines, What Members Need to Know. And specifically, this presentation is going to highlight the changes that were made to the documentation and information management standard of practice and the clinical documentation and record keeping guideline. And this presentation is just also going to um, outline how these changes might apply to your practice. So my name is Sharia Ali. I am the interim SLP practice advisor at AXLPA and I'll be moderating today. So I just have a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, first, we are using Microsoft Teams Live Events platform today, so you're not going to be able to use your microphone or camera during the presentation, but there is a Q&A forum that's available to you and that looks like the two intersecting chat bubbles with a question mark in one of them. Um, that's at the top of the window. You can post your questions or comments in there and once they're approved by the moderator, they'll show up in the Q&A box. Um, we're going to have some time for questions at the end of the presentation, but feel free to put your questions in as they come to you. You don't have to wait till the end. Uh, there's also a function to upvote a question. So if another attendee posts a question that's particularly relevant to you, you can, uh, I think, click on the thumbs up like button next to it and those questions will get upvoted. We'll try to get to those upvoted questions first um, during our question period just because they might be more relevant to more people, but we're certainly going to try to answer all of the questions um, that are posted. Um, lastly, this session is being recorded and it's going to be available on Axelpa's YouTube channel um, in about a week or so. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Susan Raffet, who is a Deputy Registrar at Axelpa. Susan has an SLP background. Um, she's been with the college since 2008. Many of you would have had conversations with Susan or would have attended past college webinars that she's presented. So you'll know that she's very knowledgeable on all things regulations. So Susan, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, uh, Sharia. Um, well, hello everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to provide an update regarding our documentation and information management standard of practice and the accompanying guideline on clinical documentation and record keeping. So as Sharia said, please feel free to enter your questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can uh, once the formal part of the presentation uh, is over. So uh, today's learning objectives, uh, we'd like you, we'd like to um, have members obtain an overview of the revised uh, standard of practice and the accompanying documentation and record keeping guideline. Um, and although the documentation and record keeping guideline was published on the AXLPA website um, a few months ago, we were awaiting the results of the government's external stakeholder consultation process on the standard of practice. Um, that always tends to take a little while. So final approvals on the standards were only obtained in June. Um, so we're now finally in a position to share both documents with you and both uh, have been approved by our council. We'd also like you to obtain clarity on why documentation and record keeping matters and to ensure that your documents incorporate all of the required elements. And, uh, you know, the standard itself states the following. Uh, a regulated member uh, maintains clear, confidential, accurate, legible, timely, and complete records in compliance with legislative and regulatory requirements. So we really want to talk about the importance of these requirements and ensure that you uh, know what you need to do to address these requirements in your practice. And then uh, the final learning objective for today is to really highlight the major changes and the rationale for those changes um, um, in, our, in our revised documents. Um, some things have changed considerably since the last release of these documents, uh, other things not so much. So we'll try to focus on, on those items that, uh, that have been re revised significantly. Uh, one moment here, I just need to check my notes. There we go. Um, so I wanted to start with uh, a slide that may be a, a repeat for some of you who have seen some of our more recent uh, webinars, but I do think it bears repeating and 
this is a word about regulation and what that encompasses as opposed to member or professional advocacy. Uh, we often receive feedback from regulated members with concerns regarding a variety of topics, you know, everything from caseload sizes to asking us to advocate with employers regarding the need for additional resources or likewise to advocate when there are cuts to services. Um, and, um, you know, while those are really valid concerns and, and I'm not here to downplay them at all, uh, many of those things um, really fall outside the realm of what um, our legislation allows us as a regulatory college to do. And, um, you know, as I mentioned in some of the past webinars um, and as our registrar mentioned with some upcoming amendments to the Health Professions Act and increasingly rigid restrictions placed on regulators relative to the kinds of association type activities that we can participate in. Um, it's just, I think, worth reminding folks that there is really a split between regulatory functions and kind of association or advocacy functions. And that is kind of greater than it really has ever been before in Alberta. So to that end, um, you know, the standards and the guidelines that we develop and we share with you today are focused on really individual requirements of, practic of practitioners that relate to safe, competent and ethical delivery of service. And hopefully these documents can be a great jumping off point for you to have good discussions with your employers and your agencies about any issues that might come up. Um, but, but our focus is really on the individual practitioner. So I'm just going to provide now a quick review of the definitions of the documents that we're going to be talking about today. Standards of practice are established measures or norms which define the minimum level of professional performance that SLPs and audiologists must demonstrate in their practice. So these are really the hard and fast kind of rules and expectations. And if there was ever a complaint or a concern that came forward about your practice, the college would look to the standard of practice and um, to, to determine whether a member had met those requirements. And that's why it's really important to be aware of them. Guidelines, on the other hand, are a little more flexible and they provide some suggestions on ways to meet the standards of practice, you know, dependent on the clinical context that you find yourself in. Um, and you'll likely notice that as we've revised some of our standards over the years, they have become much more explicit and um, specific. So, um, you know, some of the requirements that were previously outlined in guidelines have been moved over into the standards so so that it's clear that, that they are actual kind of expectations. And that's why you will probably find that many of our newer standards are also a lot more detailed than the previous ones. And for instance, if you were to compare our new documentation and record management standard with our old one from 2015, um, there's quite a bit of difference in terms of the specificity and the length of those uh, of the new standard compared to the old one. So just to kind of reiterate then, good decision making, I think, is really the intersection of these three items. Uh, you know, um, professionals need to have an understanding of standards or minimum requirements um, of guidelines that allow for some flexibility of implementation dependent on the context uh, that you find yourself in. And then we overlay on that professional judgment of the SLP or audiologist, the knowledge, the experience, the skills and abilities that each of you bring to the table. And I really liken it uh, to what we do as SLPs and audiologists in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. We consider the evidence, uh, we consider the context, we make decisions based on our knowledge and our experience, and we base those decisions on sound rationale. So just, uh, just I think a nice framework to keep in mind. I'm also just going to talk briefly about right touch regula regulation as a construct that 
that we've been using at the college and that is finding its way into many of our documents. Again, this may be a repeat for those of you who have seen some of our recent webinars, but I think it bears repeating. Um, so rate touch regulatory perspective is a construct that um, we use as part of our decision making at the college. Uh, it comes out of the United Kingdom and there's many articles and resources uh, if anyone is interested and I'm happy to share those. Um, so as I've said before, uh, this little slide is rate touch regulation at 40,000 feet above sea level. It is a very rudimentary overview um, and it really talks about the fact that um, right touch focuses on the minimum regulatory force required to achieve the desired result. So too little, too few rules, too few expectations can be ineffective and too many can be a waste of effort. And the analogy I've heard used and that I've shared before is that we don't want to use a sledgehammer to kill a fly when a fly's water is due, uh, will do, which is probably conjuring up all sorts of weird images for you. But, but I think it's just a, a kind of a neat analogy. So the idea is we don't want to go overboard with restrictions or limitations, but there needs to be enough uh, regulation so that risk to our clients is handled appropriately. Um, now, in, in the realm of documentation, you might look at our revised standard of practice and think, wow, you know, there's a lot there and are they ever being nitpicky and why so much detail? Um, and I would, I guess, argue that in the case of documentation, there are many very detailed requirements that will impact risk to the client if they're missed or overlooked um, or documented incorrectly. And you know, hence the detail in the standard. And, and we'll talk about that in a little more depth as, uh, as we go today. So, um, you know, here we talk about uh, right touch, considering and minimizing potential hazards, risks, and harms to the client. In healthcare, harm is physical injury or psychological distress experienced by people through interactions with healthcare practitioners and services. So from a physical perspective, we can think about restricted activities, which are activities that are considered to be the most physically invasive and potentially risky interventions for the client. So those are kind of obvious as high risk kinds of things that we do. But we can also think about harm in terms of clients not receiving the most appropriate intervention for their particular issue or progress being hampered due to ineffective or inappropriate targets of intervention or even inaccurate scoring and interpretation of assessments and inaccurate or non-existent documentation which could have a negative impact on the trajectory of intervention for a client or could limit their access to funding for example um, you know, I think all examples of the types of risks we're trying to uh, minimize or, or avoid altogether. And I also want to mention that these standards and guidelines were developed and reviewed by a group of your SLP and audiology peers. And of course, um, all members were given the opportunity to review these, um, these documents as part of a kind of a vetting process before they were approved. And so I think many eyes have looked at them and thought about, hmm, why are these things in here? And, um, and um, you know, kind of just that recognition that, that what's there is important and that, um, you know, there, there are impacts if we don't, um, if we don't address uh, documentation and record management appropriately. So to summarize then, in terms of a right touch framework, uh, context matters, clinical judgment and decision making are important, and absolutes are imposed when necessary. And, um, you know, as I said, you, you might ask how some of these items relate to, to documentation and record management, but, but we will we'll continue to talk about that as we go. So I'm going to start talking about why documentation and information management is so important. Uh, and I'm sure these are things you all think about uh, in your practice. But really, um, documentation and information management serve as evidence of what did or did not take place in the delivery of SLP and audiology services. 
and a key purpose of documentation is communication with clients, with other professionals, and with team members at large. And, you know, in terms of communication then, accuracy and timeliness become critically important. And another reason that communication is so important is because often funding decisions rest on the assessment results contained within a report, for example. So many of the requirements in our standard really do focus on the accuracy and the specificity of content. Protection of privacy is an integral component of documentation and the sharing and transmission of client records. Um, privacy requirements have really evolved over time, particularly with the move from paper-based to electronically-based formats um, and storage as well. So, um, you know, um, all kinds of reasons to support the importance of documentation. And I would add another, which is that uh, clear, timely and accurate documentation also serves to protect you as the professional in the event that there was ever a dispute regarding the particulars, of, um, you know, the particulars of service or say if there was ever a complaint. And I've heard it said, I think by legal counsel once that you know, an individual client just has to remember the particulars of their individual situation and it's really personal to them and chances are they're going to keep good record of that and they're going to have a pretty vivid memory of how things went. As a professional, you know, um, we, we all have um, many clients and so our memories really um, need to rely on accurate documentation because we're not always going to remember every particular of every situation. And so, you know, a, a good protection, if you will, for yourself is to make sure your notes and your reports are, are really clear and uh, thorough. So just thought that was an interesting point. So um, in terms of revision of the content of both our standard and our guidelines, I'm going to speak to each of the items on this slide in further detail in a few minutes. Um, I'm not going to speak to each and every item covered in the standard nor in the guideline. I would urge you to read those documents and to search out any sections that you think might be particularly relevant to your practice. We're always happy to answer any questions that you might have if you can't find the answers upon you know, a first review of, of the guiding documents. Uh, and, and I will have some contact information available to you uh, later on in the presentation. I'd also like to mention an overarching area of focus that we've recently been attending to here at AXLPA. Uh, we've been reviewing our key college documents from the perspective of anti-racism and anti-discrimination. And as a result, we have incorporated uh, an, an indicator in our standard of practice on documentation and record, uh, and record management, excuse me, that speaks to the issue of bias as noted on this slide. So we, um, we were, are requiring the use of language that is free of bias, which might imply prejudicial beliefs or perpetuate assumptions regarding the individual that's being written about. Um, and I think that's important and that's really a new focus. Um, you may have also recently seen revisions to our code of ethics and to all of our existing standards of practice um, that were drafted and uh, have been um, shared with the membership this past summer for, for a member vetting uh, prior to having to send those to government this fall for an external stakeholder consultation. Um, but um, uh, those, those um, um, standards and the code were all reviewed uh, with this anti-discrimination and, and anti-racism lens and so um, you know, as I said, this is an area that we are continuing to sort of build on and, and focus on um, at AXOPA. So now I'm getting into the specific areas that were listed on a couple slides back um, of some of the areas that had more substantive change um, in our standards and guideline. And the first is around electronic documentation and storage. Uh, standards. So each of these bullets are an indicator in the standard um, about expectations for regulated members. 
Um, so regulated members will ensure the presence of an audit trail uh, if they're using electronic documentation. Um, they will avoid use of social media to communicate directly with clients and they'll appropriately secure personal and health information through the use of administrative, physical and technical mechanisms such as passwords and encryption uh, as a couple of examples. There is more detail in the guideline in terms about in terms of how to go about doing some of these things um, and just a little more explanation. So again, I direct you to the guideline for more guidance on on these indicators. Um, in terms of record retention, um, the the standard, um, uh, the, the ind indicator S of the standard reads the regulated member retains records according to the length of time specified by applicable legislation and regulatory requirements. And this is an area that's gone, um, has undergone considerable revision since the last review of these documents. And so we'll go into the, uh, this in a little more detail. So uh, you can see that adult records are to be retained for 11 years and three months since the date of last service. Records for persons under disability are retained for three years and three months after their death. And records for minors are retained for 11 years and three months after the client turns 18, which is a big change. Um, so, these changes are consistent with requirements that are outlined in the Alberta Government's Limitations Act and the period of time within which records need to be maintained in order to defend against a civil claim if one was filed has also have also been factored into these figures. And according to our legal counsel, in most cases, the Limitations Act suspends a limitations period uh, when a person is a minor, meaning that the limitations period doesn't expire until 11 years and three months after the client turns 18. So hence the reason that that time period for record retention is so long. Um, you know, often agencies will be the custodians of the files and will manage them on behalf of an employee. So many of you uh, will not be the custodians of these files and, and your, your agency will be responsible for that. Um, but as a private practitioner or a contractor, you are responsible for the maintenance and the retention of your own records. So you need to consider uh, these timelines and where and how you're going to store your files. And test protocols are considered to be part of the file and they do need to be retained and they're often called upon and reviewed in the event of a complaint. So that is quite an important point to discuss with agencies who might not want to hold on to assessment protocols or who are kind of challenging that. Um, that that really is considered to be a part of the of the record and, and it is an important piece. So in terms of other types of records, um, equipment service records should be maintained for 10 years from the date of last entry and financial records should be retained for six years as per Canada Revenue Agency's guidance. I, I also want to speak to record management upon closure or transfer of a practice. An indicator V of the standard states that the regulated member takes action to prevent the abandonment of records, for example, when closing a practice. And uh, this has actually been a real thing in Alberta over the last number of years where um, professional records have been literally found abandoned. And so it's the reason that that we are expressly addressing this now in our standards and, and this is quite common across all of the health professions. There are expectations around this. So um, I'm going to talk this through in terms of the closure or transfer of a practice and I'm really mostly referring to active case files here. Uh, so records should be transferred as necessary to another SLP or audiologist. Um, if you're closing or transferring your, your practice, 
The transfer of records can be stipulated in the contract for sale of a business and clients should be informed of file transfers and should be given the option of having their records transferred to the SLP or audiologist of their choice. So, you know, if it becomes evident you are closing your practice or you're, you're selling your practice, um, obviously you would inform your clients and, you know, they might be very comfortable with, with those records being transferred or they might say, mm, you know what, we're actually going to shop around and look for a new, a new therapist, for example. Um, yeah, just want to see. Um, I think that covers that one. I'm going to move to the next one. Um, client records can be put into commercial storage for custody. Um, and if no receiving SLP or audiologist is available, records should be transferred directly to the client. So that, that is an option. Uh, regulated members should appoint another healthcare professional who agrees to serve as a successor custodian if they cannot fulfill their duties. So this last bullet is more specific than anything we've had in our guidelines previously. And again, it's the notion you can't just leave records. There has to be a plan for them. So, um, you know, as I said, you know, a lot of this applies to an active client record. If you're retiring, for example, and you have a bunch of closed client files, then you would be responsible for retaining those according to record retention requirements and storing them appropriately, um, you know, versus uh, worrying about any sort of a transfer uh, in those cases. Um, in terms of record disposal, indicator W from the standard of practice states that the regulated member disposes of records in a manner that maintains security and confidentiality of personal information. Um, and after the appropriate time has elapsed, records should be destroyed. The generally accepted methods of disposal include shredding of hard copy information and permanently purging files from a computer hard drive. And just note that simply deleting files is not enough. They actually have to be permanently purged. And if you're not sure how to manage all of those electronic requirements, I would suggest it's worth investing in some IT support and getting things done right. So another indicator uh, from the standard of practice with regards to record disposal states that the regulated member maintains a log of destroyed files, which is kept indefinitely, that includes the following information, the name of each client, the file number, the last, if there is one, the last date of treatment, and the date that the record or file was destroyed. And I mean, that can be very helpful, you know, in the event that um, you get a call from a former client many years down the road, and I can speak personally to this. I've had this happen to me. And, um, you know, then you can go back and you can see, oh, no, that, that was actually destroyed. I don't have information to share, you know, as per our legislated and regulated requirements. Um, that was destroyed and it was destroyed at this time and, and, and you've got the record. And I think that's a pretty common practice. Actually, a lot of custodians of files will, will keep records um, in the form of a log uh, around that. So that, that kind of hits the high points, I think, in terms of changes um, to our, our guideline and our standard. Um, I, I know as I was talking, I was realizing there, there is the whole, area of cloud storage and how you store files on a cloud, you know, electronically. There's a lot of information about that in our guideline, and I would urge you to look at that because uh, it really speaks to the fact that you need to be aware of how things are stored and whether or not the storage company is in compliance with what re requirements are legislatively. So um, that's just an important point, and I know a lot of people have asked about those kinds of things, so please look at the guideline if you if you uh, want to clarify um, anything and, and certainly contact us if, if your questions still are not answered. Um, at this point, I would just like to talk through the document review process uh, a little bit, just so you get a sense of all the checks and balances and accountabilities that went into the development of these um, documents. Um, I, I, I think that uh, it, I hope it's helpful to you to to um, to kind of know the process of, of how these things are developed. 
So obviously a need for document revision was identified and this came from individual members contacting the college as well as from staff who identified you know, changing trends in this area and in privacy legislation. And then of course, simply the passage of time. The last time our documentation guideline was reviewed was in or developed was in 2011, uh, which is 10 years ago. And the last time the standard was uh, revised was in 2015. So this information was then coupled with a review of the literature, benchmarking with other colleges, um, both in Alberta and our sister colleges across the country, uh, and specifically a review of uh, many of the documents and requirements of the Office of the Privacy Commissioner also uh, took place uh, to arrive at a draft guideline and a draft standard of practice. And these were discussed and debated by our practice advisory committee and by staff. And um, the Practice Advisory Committee is a group of regulated SLPs and audiologists who volunteered their time to participate on the committee. And I would just like to send our thanks to Nasheen Khan, to Diane Nunziato Tali, Selena Vermi, and to Axel staff Cheryl Blair and former Director of Professional Practice Sandy Nickel for all of the time and effort they put into reviewing these documents. Once the final draft of both the guideline and the standard were ready, they were then circulated to, to you, the membership, for vetting. And then a copy of the standard of practice was forwarded to Alberta Health to complete an, exter an external stakeholder consultation, um, which is a requirement um, of any um, new or revised uh, standards or codes of ethics. So the feedback was obtained from this external review by government and then um, a final round of revisions before um, these documents went to ACSFA Council for final approvals uh, and, and posting uh, on our website. And a couple of additional asides. Um, we've kind of moved to a new uh, format with our, our guidelines where what we've started doing is embedding the standard of practice indicators directly into the guidelines so you can see how the standard and the guideline work together and how they complement one another and um, you know again we, we encourage you to utilize these documents as jumping off point for discussion with your peers with your peers from other um, disciplines and with your employers uh, as a mechanism to educate um, others regarding our professional requirements and expectations. I just wanted to mention there is a supplemental article on timeliness of document documentation. It was developed many years ago, but the content actually remains as pertinent as ever. So I would really urge you to read it when you get the chance. It's also available on the website. Finally, um, just to say again, obviously today we are going to be talking and addressing questions that may have come up uh, throughout this webinar, but we're really happy to take your questions at any time. And I've provided names and emails here for ease of access, but um, certainly um, our contact information is available on the website and, um, and there are mechanisms to get emails to us and we do our best to get back to you within probably 24 to 48 hours. So um, I think with that, I am going to turn it over to Sharia who will mediate the question and answer portion of the webinar. Okay, um, so we just had two posts in the Q&A so far. Um, the first one is a comment from someone just appreciating the anti-racism initiative. And um, with that, I will just plug the uh, membership diversity survey that went out, I think on September 16th. So if you haven't had a chance to fill that out, uh, please do click on the link to that survey and fill it out. Um, and the other question that we have is, um, how do running notes fall into records retention? Good question. Uh, so I would say your, your, your running notes, your chart notes, um, you need to follow the record retention requirements that are outlined in the standard for those. Um, and this is where, you know, um, there can be chart notes and then sometimes people have um, ghost files or um, 
um, you know, extra bits of paper and, and little slips with notes on them. And, th and, and this is where we really recommend that to, to try and get your get your charts into a into good order uh, and on a fairly regular basis go through and figure out what is part of the running chart note and what are little extras that don't need to be there and um, and make sure that that you have it you know in an appropriate sort of uh, organized um, I guess manner um, and uh, you know, I, I don't know how many agencies are doing this idea. I, I remember when I was, you know, working in, in clinical practice uh, at an agency where, you know, we had a, an SLP file and then there was the main chart, right? And I, I kept stuff in my SLP file, but then formal documents went to the main chart. And actually, running chart notes actually did go to that chart as well. So ultimately, everything went into that one chart. Um, you know, as, as we talk about um, in some of the guideline information, um, you need to make sure that the that the right information is kept, right? Because it it's it's the history. So I would say chart notes are an important part of the history. And also, people who are in private practice often, unless somebody's paying you, you're not writing you're not writing a report. You know, you may never write a report. But so it's your chart notes that are going to give all of that detail and all of that background. And so that's what you need to keep. So it's really less about the form of the documentation and more about the retention of whatever form you happen to be using, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Susan. We have another question that just came in. It's sort of related to that, but um, this person was asking, in a PUF program where therapists are in the classroom every day, is there an expectation or guideline regarding the amount of documentation? You do need to provide updates. Like when you see clients, I think one of the things we talk about in the standard is that there need to be um, notations of when clients are seen uh, and when clients um, you know, cancel or are absent or kind of any of these kinds of things. And um, if you are seeing clients, um, you need to document. So you need to, you know, I, I think I think you can use your judgment, you know, how how, how lengthy or concise does that need to be? Um, there are There is some information, I believe, in the guideline about the fact that if you are running a very specific program, it follows a certain structure, it has so many weeks to it, and you know you have an outline of that and that is part of your your chart you know you could say you know group treatment group you know phonology treatment started such and such a date you know to to run for eight weeks please see um you know a protocol on file and then maybe that's broken down as to what's being done in each of those sessions and if somebody misses you just indicate in your chart note johnny's sick today missed appointment um, and you refer to that protocol. So if that helps make it easier for you, by all means, but I, I think you you just need to know you need to document. So how, what it, whatever works from that perspective. Okay, thanks Susan. We had a couple other questions come in. So first one I'll get to um, says, I work in a diagnostic clinic at ACH. We take observations in note-taking form, but then use these to compose our report. Do we need our handwritten notes uh, and the summary report or and the summary report, or does the SCM document suffice? Um, sorry, SCM, um, what does that stand for? I am not sure. Maybe the, um, the summary. I guess they were asking, so they take handwritten notes and then they have a, a formal report. Um, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong if you posted this question, but probably asking around, um, do both of those things need to be retained? Right. Those handwritten notes and the report. I think that's like it's a bit of a fine line and and you probably need to determine that for yourself. Um, I'm thinking back to when I was doing those kinds of assessments. So for instance, 
So I would have some handwritten notes and I might have a language sample that that I was writing as I went. Then I then I would probably summarize some of that in a chart note. And if I was writing a report, you know, it would it would get you know more depth and, and formality would be would be part of my my report. Um, but I would definitely want to hold on to that language sample because that's almost like a test protocol, right? So I, I want to, I want my language sample retained as part of my raw data. Now, if my language sample was nice and separate from my notes, then the notes might have just become part of those other, you know, chart notes and reports. So I wouldn't hold on to those, but I definitely hold on to the language sample part. The, the way I work, and I don't know if other people are like this, I tend to start writing stuff all over the place. So um, I might decide, you know what, I'm just keeping that whole piece of paper because it's got my whole language sample plus a few other notes on it. That's okay, I can live with that. And so that becomes part of my raw data. Okay, thanks Susan. Um, I've had a couple other questions come in as well, so I'll just get to the other one. Um, Someone asked about um, requirements for emails with information about clients. Um, there is some information about that in the guideline. I think the 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 tricky issue with email is email, as has been explained to me by IT people, is like sending a postcard. So a postcard, everybody has the potential to see, you know, the the writing on the on the non-picture side of the postcard. And so email is like that too, unless unless it's encrypted or you know there's some privacy around that. So I, I think email you need to be careful with and and I, I would say look to the guideline for specifics. And I would also say if you are using guide or email for for any reason, think about what you're what you're documenting in the email. Like it might be very appropriate to have a conversation with a client via email. You're you know you're booking a time for an appointment or whatever. But when you're getting into the details of the child's performance. Um, you might not want to have all that, um, particularly I'm thinking of, you know, standardized assessment results and that sort of thing. You might not put into an email or you'd be really careful that what's in the email isn't specifying who specifically you're talking about. So I think there are fine, again, there are fine lines with this stuff, but, but I refer you back to the guideline. Okay, thanks Susan. Um, questions are coming in really quickly. Um, so, there's another question about um, what is the expectation for SLPs to go back and ensure that old files are kept according to the new guidelines? Yeah, that's that's good. Well, I mean, obviously, if you've already um, destroyed files according to a, an old record retention um, protocol, there's not much you can do about that. But I would say going forward, anything that you have, you now need to think about in terms of the the new um, the new retention requirement. So if you still have, and I'll speak, I have, I'm looking over at my, my locked file cabinet there. Uh, you know, uh, I have, I have private practice files from several years ago that I was just about thinking would be ready to, to go into the shredder and um, they will no longer be going into the shredder because the, that requirement has changed. So um, I, that's how I would view that. Okay. Thanks, Susan. Um, so the next question is, what piece of legislation did you find the specific timeframes? Um, and they mentioned that they had looked through a couple, so the records management regulation and the developing records retention um, and disposition schedules, but they can't find the, that information um, in those documents. So um, are there references in the AXLPA documents of when those timeframes, um, the legislation that those timeframes came from? Uh, the Limitations Act is one of the uh, pieces of, of legislation, and I will tell you that every, probably every college interprets this slightly differently, and every legal um, counsel <laughs> uh, might give you a slightly different um, perspective. And so, you know, we looked at a number of factors. We looked at the Limitations Act. We looked at some of the old information we had from things like the Hospital Act, which is really not relevant to all of our areas of practice. 
we looked at um, then, um, you know, the addition of, of thinking about litigation and the potential for litigation. And then we looked at, and, and so all of that was reviewed by our legal counsel for the final kind of results. So really the Limitations Act and um, I, I, you mentioned a couple of specific documents, Sharia. I don't know what those were uh, again. Yep. Yeah, so the records management regulation and developing records retention and disposition schedules. And I'm not sure where those specifically came from or, or what, what those documents are. Um, they're not ringing a bell with me right now. And I'm happy to take this offline if somebody's looking for something specific. So we can have a conversation. If you want to just let us know your email address or put it in the chat and Sharia and I can follow up. Um, yeah. Okay, um, and we have a few more questions. So we have another attendee who says, I am retiring and I have a lot of closed files. I understand now that I need to hold on to most of these files for the next 12 to 15 years. Uh, they say, I will be quite old by the time uh, this time comes up. It sounds like you would encourage me to find another SLP to be the custodian, the custodian of these files at some point in the future. Um, how do you suggest I go about this? Good questions, all of them. And this is kind of new and it's new to all of us. Um, I, I think it's a matter of figuring out, like, first of all, I mean, um, probably just to have a kind of a backup plan. Like it may be that, that I'm, you know, I'm not sure how old you're going to be, but, but it may be that, um, you know, you can kind of go through and, and, um, and then um, you may be in a position to actually just shred or close or do whatever you need to do down the road if if that's not the case or if you're anticipating that yeah this is going to become an issue i think it it actually just comes down to to um thinking about your network thinking about your network of slps thinking about folks that that you feel you could approach on this and have a conversation about in the event that that um that you need to call upon them um I recall having had some conversations with physiotherapy about this too, and I know that they've had situations where, um, you know, at, at some point, you know, somebody um, uh, did pass away who, who had records and then um, it was the, the person who was responsible for their estate that had to manage, you know, the fact that these things had to be disposed of appropriately. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I think our first preference is to have somebody who kind of has some sense of all of this, you know, obviously a regulated health professional who can who can manage this. Um, I guess push come to shove, though, it, it may become part of um, something that has to be managed um, by an estate. OK, um, so thanks for that, Susan. Another question is, um, is a report always necessary? I am providing a service to a school and they don't want a report as a cost savings measure. Is that OK? Or is a report always mandatory? A report is not mandatory. We do not mandate the form of documentation. Um, what is mandatory is that you document uh, and that can be done in many different ways. And, and I think I, I mentioned the example of sometimes in private practice, for example, a family may come because they want you to work on a particular goal with their child. They don't want to be sharing information with anyone else. It's pretty straightforward. Really a report isn't needed. Sometimes a family might not want to report, but as you, you know, it becomes apparent to you in your work that, oh, you know, we really would need a report here because we're going to be seeking some funding and we need to go down that road. So you have that conversation and then there's an agreement and, and there's a willingness to, to go forward with that. Um, you know, in the case of a school, um, I think, I, mean, I think that's a reality that that we are, you know, living in a time when people are looking at cost saving measures. I guess the question is, in your professional opinion, mm -hmm. you know, is is uh, a report needed and, and why would it be needed or would a chart note suffice or would a letter summarizing some information suffice? Uh, you know, it, so I think it's a matter of just looking at like, what are you trying? What is the need for the documentation? What are you trying to communicate and to whom are you trying to communicate and how can that be managed and then come up with something that that works? 
Okay, uh, we have a couple of sort of related questions to that. Um, another question is, for individuals contracted through a larger company, is the individual the custodian or the company? Um, should this be something indicated in the contract? I think it's a good idea to indicate it in the contract. I actually do, and because this comes up sometimes and it's not really clear and I think there are different ways it can be handled like um, you know there are companies that are um, they, they want to be the owner of the file because maybe there's going to be ongoing uh, involvement with a with a with a child or with a with a case with a client um, down the road and it's going to come back to that that business and the business is then going to have new therapists involved with that client but sometimes it's not like that. Sometimes it's very clearly, you know, you're being contracted to provide service to a number of clients and and you're not, you know, we're not we're not taking them on as an agency going forward. And so then you need to know that as a contractor. So I, I think it's good to have the conversation and and figure that out. OK, thanks. Uh, another question is what if uh, your file life extends your own? So you sort of um, talked about, um, you know, finding another professional to be the custodian, but I guess um, I'm sort of reading this question is if that wasn't in place, yeah. um, what would you, what would happen to those files that are? Um, if something happened to you as the, mm -hmm. the owner of the file? Yes. <laughs> Good question. Mm -hmm. um, I think, again, it would probably come down to then, well, um, first of all, if you can have a backup plan uh, right up front, that would really be ideal because then you can have a notation, um, you know, in your records or with somebody key that you know um, and you trust um, who knows what's supposed to happen. Um, I think I think that's a good idea to, to just sort of have the backup plan in place. Um, if there's no backup plan, then I, I guess it's going to come down to um, hoping that there is somebody around who is looking at things responsibly and asking the right questions, you know, and, and perhaps even contacting the college just to ask the question, like, what do we do now? Um, that may not seem like a very um, great answer, but that's kind of what what comes to my mind right now. Um, yeah. I, some of this is is also kind of new like you know you gotta think too that i mean audiologists have always been in private practice a lot of them um slps you know more and more um so i think there are going to be more more issues around that kind of thing as as we go forward and uh, thanks for that susan another question that we had is if you work for a school board and they have their own methods of um, electronic documentation, is the expectation that these guidelines are shared with the school division? How do we ensure that we are following the guidelines and standards of practice regarding privacy, um, encryption, retention of documents? Yeah, I think that's a very good question and it is another one that I don't think I've got a real black and white for you. I think that it's always great to share the information and I think that um, again if you're dealing with a really well established agency that comes under very clear legislation whether that that's the Health Information Act or um, you know the Freedom of um, um, the FOIP or you know different different acts like school boards and and Alberta Health Services you know they've 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 likely, well, they do have groups of people managing these things and dealing with them. And and so I think they're probably following whatever they need to follow. If there's a real obvious, like a real discrepancy between something that AXLPA is telling you as a, as a provider and what they're doing, I think it's good to have the conversation to say, for instance, I gave the example of the, the um, retention of test protocols. That is really important. And you know, it does kind of seem crazy that you as the SLP has to take those, that piece and take those home and save those when you're not saving anything else. Like it just doesn't make sense. So I think having that conversation and sharing the document around that would be great. There might be other pieces that, you know, we would say, well, let's do it this way or let's do it that way. But, you know, or the record retention part, well, they may have a record retention guideline that's very specific 
specific, excuse me, to their agency to um, it falls within all of the legislated requirements that they have. So they're they're going to run with that likely, you know, and um, what we're trying to do is give you sort of the best that we can um, and and primarily, um, you know, it's going to be private practitioners and contractors who are going to have to really uh, abide by these things. But where you see a discrepancy with an agency that you work for, I think it's great to have the conversation and then to see how that evolves. And you're not, if you're not the custodian of the record, you're not responsible for the record in the same way. So I don't think you should lose sleep over it. Okay, thanks, Susan. Um, here's another question about, um, as a contractor working for an agency, does the agency become the custodian of the files? And I guess we were saying there needs to be some sort of agreement set up. Um, they're not automatically assumed to be the custodian. Am I getting that right? Yeah, not necessarily. And actually the words custodian even, you know, uh, that has very particular meanings. Like in the Health Information Act, we talk about custodians. We don't necessarily talk about custodians in all of the acts, so probably shouldn't use just that term. Um, but um, yeah, I think you need to have the conversation and you need to sort that out. And I think a lot of it is just being transparent and clear and documenting what's what's the plan for documentation, right? Uh, and, and that will go a long way. Okay, thanks Susan. So we have two sort of related questions. Um, the first is, is there a sample of how a digital file system is set up that practitioners could use as an example of the requirements. And then the next question was, uh, will there be a webinar doing a, a show and share of samples of uh, proper file systems? Probably not. I'll be very upfront with you because honestly, we just simply don't have the resources to do that. And we are not experts in electronic file systems. So I think uh, you're best off to look at what is out there, what is commercially available, to look at how um, those things meet the requirements that are outlined in legislation. Um, you could, you know, have a conversation certainly with um, uh, the the provider of those of those um, um, different systems. Um, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner has lots of information on their website in terms of requirements and expectations. They do have people you can contact there as well. I think this is also why you want good IT providers helping you out if you are really going down this road. I realize people who are doing less private practice or small amounts of private practice, you're going to probably have to think about this differently because the costs that you incur for this hmm, might be prohibitive. Um, uh, so you might need to think about you know, utilizing a different approach or, or minimizing what you do electronically. Um, so yeah, lots to think about, but we're not really in the IT sort of knowledgeable part of this. Okay, thanks Susan. Um, so another question that came in was, um, can you review what the previous retention guideline was? And I appreciate you might not have that information on hand. Yeah, I don't have it on hand. I'd have to go back to an old uh, version of the guideline, but I think it was more like um, 10 years or three years after the age of majority, whichever comes first for minors. And now it's 11 years and three months after the kid turns 18. So that I think is the difference there. Um, with adult retention, honestly, I don't remember off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up. Okay. Thanks. If somebody <laughs> is wanting that information specifically, though, um, send me an email directly to deputy register at axelpa.ca and I can see what I can find. Okay, thanks. Um, another question. Uh, if standardized testing is done, is a report slash letter necessary um, as opposed to simply our file notes? And if a client leaves your practice and goes to another SLP, do we have a responsibility to ensure the next SLP has the results from the tests done? Um, there's no requirement on a formal assessment just because you've done standardized testing. Uh, Again, that's about the form of the documentation rather than the fact that you've documented. So that's really up to you and how you provide information and what's in the best interests of those you are communicating with, I would say. Um, 
and also how many other pieces of information do you have to share, right? I think that's the beauty of a report is you're pulling all these different impressions and information together to arrive at a picture and some recommendations. So um, that's the first part of that. What was the, what was the? Uh, so the second part was if a client leaves your practice and goes to another SLP, do we have a responsibility to ensure that the next SLP has the results from the test done? Um, that's really partly a decision of um, your client as well, right? Because um, the client has to provide informed consent um, for, for information sharing, or typically they do. I mean, I know there there's the, um, what's the act, the one act on children that uh, um, allows for some information sharing without parental consent, but typically you're looking for consent. So, so you know, if a parent says, yeah, we're moving on, or, you know, your agency, that the, the time frame is now ended for your involvement and they're moving to somewhere, someone else, you know, you obtain the appropriate consents and, and I think it's good practice to share, you know, updated information. Uh, I don't think it's a requirement. Like you, you don't, you know, a parent might say, I don't, I don't really, would, don't want you sharing any information, you're not in a position to share then. Um, and, and I'll be honest too, that I think, you know, oftentimes when the new clinician starts with somebody, they're doing their own little thing to kind of figure out where the child is at before they get going. Certainly having information can be helpful, but it, it's not mandated. Okay, so we have just one last uh, post in here, so I'm just going to put out a last call for questions if you have any, um, but this post has two questions in it. So the first one is, where the employer is often the custodian of client files, etc., but it is the SLP who is legally and ethically responsible for the client care that took place, is it recommended that the SLP also retain notes? Um. I don't know. That's uh, that's kind of tough because an agency, and if you're an employee of an agency, I think you have some requirements around, you know, who's the owner of the documentation. And so when you depart, um, I think those documents stay with the employer. Um, if there's a different agreement or if there's um, some reason, some, you know, special reason why you might want to keep those things, then um, maybe there's a, a case to be made for that. Um, I don't think on, an, on a regular basis would you be doing that. I think as a contractor or a, as a, if you're an employee, I should say, if you're a contractor or a private practitioner, I think it's a different ball of wax because you're responsible for kind of everything from the beginning to the end unless you have an agreement as a contractor that says something different. So I think in that case, yeah, you you do want to keep copies of things. Okay. And so the second part of that uh, question was, is a recommendation different if the SLP estimates reasonably that the employer will not take reasonable measures to retain records appropriately slash unaltered? Mm, that's a really good question. And that is an awkward situation, right? Um, I still think it comes back to who actually is the owner of the record and um, I think if you were concerned about that, you might need to document that you have concerns about how records are being kept uh, and, and I don't know where that goes. I don't know if that goes to, to the agency, they might not care or if that goes that that's something you keep a copy of so that in the event that something came back later, you would say, yes, I expressed my concerns. I have a note to that effect about this, but you know, you don't want to get caught in a situation where now you're holding on to things that aren't rightfully yours, I think is the other problem. And honestly, if it got to that point and it was really that messy, I would suggest you might want to actually get some legal guidance on that because um, that's kind of a very complicated situation. Mm -hmm. So I don't have any um, further questions right now. I have a couple comments just saying thank you so much, Susan. It was very informative. Um, so unless there are any other questions, I'm thinking we can maybe wrap up a bit earlier. We'll give it a couple seconds. Sounds um, great. 
Yeah, and the and I mean, this will be on YouTube. And again, if people have other questions that come up after today or you're talking with your colleagues and you realize you didn't ask about something, um, we're more than happy to uh, take your questions via email or, or phone. OK, so I'm, I'm not seeing any other questions come in, so I think we will um, thank everyone for attending today and for participating and for your questions. And thank you to Susan for that um, really informative webinar as well. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>